Hello, wonderful people. My name is Mike, and I play a lot of Pokemon games. Like, a lot of Pokemon games. And I wanted to challenge myself on one of my playthroughs more than just a traditional Nuzlocke. So I had the genius idea to see if I could beat Pokemon Yellow without taking a single hit point of damage. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. Why would someone want to do this? Well, honestly, I wanted to see if it could be done. I've seen GameChamp 3000's Pokemon Red Damageless video, as well as Small Ant's Pokemon Platinum Damageless video, both of which will be linked in the description below if you haven't seen them before. But I've never seen someone do this in Pokemon Yellow. Plus, I love the Gen 1 games. Pokemon Red was my first game ever, and Pokemon Yellow I also have a lot of really fond memories playing as a kid. So I wanted to beat this game in the most difficult way possible. Before we get into the run, I wanted to explain the rules. As the title would suggest, if at any point during the run we take so much as even a single hit point of damage, whether that's from a direct attack or a status condition or whatever, we get a reset to the last save point. And in order to keep things moving and make my life a little less miserable, I decided to adopt the small ant rules of every time you beat a gym, you are allowed to save and use that as a checkpoint. But those are the only saves we will be allowed for the entirety of the run. Also, I will be beating the game without any glitches or exploits, because Gen 1 is pretty broken, and if I allowed that, I could just glitch the game out and beat the game without even leaving Pallet Town. This run really came down to strategy more than anything else. So as we go through, I'll fill you guys in on the decisions I made, the struggles we faced, and why I did what I did. Before we jump in, if you enjoy this video, please consider leaving a like, a comment, and subscribing to the channel. I greatly appreciate every single one of you guys checking out my content here. Also, this whole challenge was live streamed over on my Twitch channel, so if you want to join me for my next adventure, feel free to follow me over there as well. I do a lot of Pokemon challenges, Nuzlocke's, and a whole bunch of other fun stuff. I would love for you guys to come by and say hi sometime. Plus, the full VODs of this entire run are still posted over there, so if for some reason you guys want to go check those out, that is where you'll be able to find them. So, with all that out of the way, let's head into Pallet Town and start our damageless journey. At the start of the game, I named my character Mike, for obvious reasons, and our rival was named Damage, because that was going to be our biggest enemy for this run by far. After almost getting killed in the tall grass and saved by Oak, we made our way back to the lab where we were given our Pikachu, who I named Lucky because we're really going to need some good luck here. It was at this point before the rival fight that I decided to save, since this really wasn't against the spirit of the run, and I didn't want to have to do the setup part over and over again. This brought us to our first roadblock of the run, the rival fight in Oak's lab. Unlike other starters, Pikachu actually starts out with a Stab Attack Thundershock, so we're able to deal more damage than if we only knew Scratch or Tackle. Also, because critical hits are calculated by base speed in this generation, and Pikachu's is a fantastic 90, we have a pretty high chance of landing a crit. However, as you can imagine, this fight is extremely luck-based. Our rival's Eevee knows Tackle and Tail Whip, meaning we need to have a battle where they either use nothing but Tail Whip or miss Tackle for the entire fight. Which isn't impossible since it was only 95% accuracy in Gen 1, but definitely unlikely. So we entered the fight and prepared for what was sure to be a relentless stream of reset after reset after reset. Only somehow we got incredibly lucky and got past it after only 11 resets. Tail whip too. Please give me the para, give me a crit, give me something. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, guys, 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 guys. <sighs> Yes! I know in this game it's not as hard as others, but even still 11 resets isn't bad. So we headed north, completed Oak's task because I guess there's no mail delivery to Pallet Town, got our Pokedex and we're on our way. While we could have done the optional rival fight, I skipped it for two reasons. The first one being why add another battle that we can very easily avoid if we don't have to. But the other is that what your rival's Eevee evolves into as well as their final team for this game is determined by the outcome of the first two rival fights. If you win both the Lab Fight and the Route 22 battle, he'll have a Jolteon. If you win the Lab Fight, but either pass up on the Route 22 fight or lose it, he'll have a Flareon. And if you lose the Lab Fight, he'll have a Vaporeon. Obviously there is no way in this run for our rival to have the Vaporeon team, since losing that fight would make us reset. So I wanted him to have Flareon, but we'll get into that later. We made our way straight to the Viridian Forest and caught our newest member of the team, Metapod. Butterfree learns the move Psybeam at level 34 in this game which is going to be very necessary for us to beat Brock, since for Pikachu to be strong enough to one-shot his team, he would have to get to an insanely high level. Also, catching Metapod makes more sense than Caterpie, since Metapod can't attack us, so if it breaks out, we have no risk of taking any damage. So, we found a Metapod, caught it, and named it Better Flea, 
since we knew we better flee away from as many battles as possible if we wanted to stand a chance in this run. Like I said, in order for us to successfully beat Brock, we needed Psybeam on Butterfree. So we decided the best course of action would be to grind up Butterfree to level 34 and Pikachu to level 28. But right as we were about to really grind, this happened. Yodo. What? No. No, please no. Please no. Please no. Please no. Guys. I didn't know this could happen. There are Pidgeotos here? Oh, please don't attack us. Please. Please no. Oh, you've got to be kidding me! <sighs> Why are there Pidgeotos here? I didn't know that was a thing. That was just annoying. It had me pretty concerned, since that could be a really big potential roadblock for our grinding moving forward. So, unfortunately, we had to reset back to the lab. But somehow, we got crazy RNG luck and beat the rival fight on the very next attempt. So, we did what we had to do and went back to the forest to grind. Only, I accidentally attacked a Pidgey, and I didn't one-shot it, and we took a gust to the face. This time, we beat the rival in 16 more resets, and once again, we're on our way. Now is probably a really good time to bring up something that anybody playing Gen 1 should know because it was a very serious roadblock for us, and that's the 1 in 256 glitch. Basically, to sum this up, in Gen 1, whether or not a move is going to hit is calculated by a formula that uses a random number generator that generates a number between 0 and 255. Depending on the accuracy of the move and other conditions such as accuracy drops or items used, that number generated has to be below a certain number for the move to hit. For a 100% accuracy move, if that number is less than 255, the move will hit. However, if that number comes up as exactly 255, because it's technically not less than 255, the move can and will miss. That means that for all 100% accuracy moves, besides Swift, which bypasses this altogether, there is always a 0.39% chance that that move will miss. So, in order for us to be as safe as possible and have the best chances of avoiding this glitch, I decided we were only going to grind on Metapods in the Verdian Forest before Brock. Metapods, like I said before, only know the move Harden, so even if we were to miss or not one-shot, there is no way for them to deal damage. Unfortunately, Metapods only have a 20% chance of appearing in the forest, so we had to keep finding encounters and running away if they weren't the ones we needed. Also unfortunately for us is that killing Metapods gives defense EVs, which in a damageless run are completely useless. But, it was the safest way for us to get the experience we needed, so we just grinded away. Now, I really need to stress this for those of you who might be considering doing one of these runs of your own. This was by far the worst part of the entire challenge. Metapods only appear at level 4 and level 6 in this spot, which means they either give 41 or 61 experience. So in order for us to get to the level we need to be honored to beat Brock, we had to kill literally hundreds and hundreds of them. In addition, this was the only place that we could successfully grind for the first two gyms. Since in order for us to get past Cerulean, you need to beat Misty. So we needed to do all of our grinding on both Pikachu and Butterfree in this location. I kid you not, this part of the run gave me actual headaches. I played it on maximum speed up, but I had to pay just enough attention to see what the encounters were so I knew whether or not I needed to run away or attack, all while talking to my amazing chat and having to keep track of PP so I knew when to heal. I killed so many Metapods, I can still hear their screams at night when I sleep. Now I'm sure you might be thinking, oh Mike, come on, a 0.39% chance is really not that bad. You could have grinded on anything and this would have gone so much faster. Well, in my zoned out phase of grinding, this happened. Is it even worth grinding up? I couldn't believe what had just happened. We were just about to be done grinding Pikachu as well. That one really hurt, but we pushed through and after 46 total resets, we beat the rival battle again and we're back to the Metapod slaughter. We spent over four hours of stream time grinding up the team. Like I said, this is the worst part. And we finally got both Pikachu and Butterfree to the levels we were aiming for so we could take on Brock. Yes, three streams into this and we were taking on the first gym. I told you guys this was a brutal one. Thanks to our crazy overleveled Butterfree, Brock was a total pushover, going down to two Psybeams, and we got not only the first badge, but the first save of the game. 
This meant that no matter what, we would never have to go back to that fight in Oak's lab ever again. And let me tell you, that felt amazing. So at this point, we decided that it would make sense to clear out all the required trainers on Route 3 first, then go do some more grinding, and then take on Mount Moon. Like I said before, once we get to Cerulean, there's really no safe place to grind, so we needed to grind for both Misty and the rival fight on the Nugget Bridge as well. I made my way over to the Gauntlet of Trainers, only to get friggin' 1 and 256 glitched to a Rattata. Like I said, this is a serious thing to worry about in Gen 1. But thankfully it was only the second fight, and we had just saved it Brock, so it could have been a lot worse. After a quick reset, the battles were all a breeze, with Pikachu quick attacking any Pokemon who also had quick attack, which is something we'll get to later. We then paid the $500 for the Magikarp, since I wasn't sure if I'd use it, and that's honestly not too bad a deal. After doing some research on what was up ahead, we decided to do a little more grinding so that we could deal with the upcoming rival fight. Pikachu needed to be strong enough to one-shot other quick attack Pokemon with his own quick attack, since at this time that was the only way we could deal with that. So, we decided to get lucky up to level 33, and better flee to level 38. And did nothing with Magikarp, since honestly he was kinda just there. Mount Moon was relatively uneventful, although I did take the Helix Fossil, because... internet. And we hopped the one-way ledge of no return. No matter what happened after this point, we were locked into taking on both Misty and the entirety of Nugget Bridge before we had a safe spot to grind again. But based on the calculations we did and the matchups we have, I really wasn't too worried about it. Just to be safe though, we decided to take on Misty first, since I wanted to get the checkpoint in case something went wrong with our rival, and I felt pretty confident in Pikachu's ability to one-shot any water Pokemon at this point in the game. And... I was right. It was an easy fight for us with Pikachu Thunderbolting both her Pokemon, and we got the all-important second save of the game. From there we headed north and took on rival number three, which as expected was a little more challenging than Misty, but still nothing crazy. Spearow went down to a Thunderbolt, Sandshrew to a Psybeam from Butterfree, I switched Pikachu back in to Quick Attack his Rattata, since it also knew Quick Attack, and then we took down Eevee with a Thunderbolt. After that, I felt pretty good, as I thought the worst was behind us for a while, so we made our way through the Nugget Bridge. Things were going just as planned, until we made it to the fourth trainer, Lass. Lass leads off with a level 16 Pidgey that knows Quick Attack, meaning that I had to lead off with Pikachu to use Quick Attack as well. At this level, Pikachu's Quick Attack was just weak enough to not Oko this Pidgey, and it hit us with Gust. Honestly, I didn't even think to calc this out, because I didn't think it'd be an issue. So a couple levels of grinding would have solved this, but I figured that since we weren't that far past the last save, we could just run it back and try again. So we made it past the rival in the first three battles again, and this time I figured since she used Gust last time that maybe a Thunderbolt was the right play, so we could just one-shot the stupid thing. But I forgot that Gen 1 AI cheats, and this time she used Quick Attack, so that was yet another reset. So this is where I was starting to get worried that I might have to find a spot to grind up a few levels, but I figured I would try one more time and just hope for good crit luck. But thankfully, this time after we used Quick Attack, it used Sand Attack, and thanks to some clutch RNG, we didn't miss our next Quick Attack and we took the damn Pidgey down. We took down the rest of Nugget Bridge, sadly declined the nice offer to join Team Rocket, and got our newest Pokemon, a Gift Charmander. I originally named him Dracarys, but immediately wanted to change its name to Hamilton, because I like that name better. For those of you who've been around my channel before, you guys know that Charizard is my favorite Pokemon of all time. Yes, I know that's a very basic Pokemon to choose, but it's mine, so deal with it. And I was very excited to add this thing to the team. We made our way to Bill and turned him back into a person, for which we were rewarded with the SS ticket. Not only that, but this now opened up what was going to be the most useful place in the entire run, the daycare center. In Gen 1, you can leave one Pokemon at a time in the daycare center, since breeding wasn't a thing yet, and they gain experience equal to one point for every in-game step you take. This means that by leaving a Pokemon in the daycare center and running up and down for a crazy long amount of time, we were able to never have to grind in the wild again, and we could get our team to a high enough level where the majority of the game would be significantly easier. My only fear here was that I wanted to stagger some of the grinding in case we got 1 and 256 again and lost all that progress before the next gym, since we had a lot of battles coming up before we could save again. So, I deposited Butterfree and began the first of many of these sessions of me running up and down Route 5 on full speed until we gained as many levels as possible. I'm not even kidding here when I say doing this was a majority of the time we spent from this point forward in the game, since even at max speed, this still takes forever. After getting Butterfree to level 69, we put Pikachu in there to level him up as well. 
To pass the time, I gave chat a preview of what was, at the time, my newest YouTube video, my Sword and Shield Elite Trainer Box opening. But as I was going to check on Pikachu's progress, this happened. Doesn't sound very fun. <gasps> oh no, please tell me I can run. Please tell me I can run. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. No! Yup. I forgot that when you add a Pokemon back on the team, they go to the bottom of your party. And when I deposited Pikachu into the daycare, it put friggin' Magikarp at the front. This means that not only did we lose all that time I had just spent running up and down like a maniac, but that we also had to do the dreaded last fight again with that stupid Pidgey. So, again, we made our way back through the rival fight in the first three trainers on the bridge with no issues, and thankfully once again her Pidgey used Sand Attack instead of hitting us, so we were okay. This time I did name Charmander Hamilton, because he just looks like a Hamilton. And in no time, we were back to daycare grinding. This time I decided I was just going to grind up Pikachu as much as I could and go from there, since I really just wanted that next save point. So we got lucky to level 88. I knew that a level 88 Pikachu and a level 39 Butterfree could handle everything between now and Surge, so I wasn't too worried. We went south for Vermilion and boarded the SSN to get cut and deal with our rival once again. The fight with damage wasn't too different from last time, especially with a level 88 Pikachu on the team, so we Thunderbolted the Spearow and then quick attacked his Rattata, Sandshrew, and Eevee. After giving an uncomfortable and horribly inappropriate back rub to the ship's captain, he gave us the HM for cut and we got off the pedo ship once and for all. I taught Cut to Hamilton the Charmander, which is important, so remember that. And after struggling with the damn trash can puzzle for longer than I care to admit, we were ready to take on Surge. In this game, just like the anime, Surge only has a Raichu on his team, so our level 88 Pikachu was more than strong enough to take it down with one Thunderbolt. We got the Thunder Badge, as well as the all-important third save point of the run. Outside the gym, we were given a gift squirtle from Officer Jenny that we appropriately named Turtle and added to the team. The plan from here was to do more daycare grinding. So we went back up to the daycare man and went to drop off Hamilton the Charmander first. But the game had different plans. I'll do Hamilton first. Oh, get the frick out of here. There's no move deleter? No, guys. Oh, no, I made a big mistake. I made a big mistake. Apparently in Gen 1, if you teach one of your Pokemon an HM, they can't go in the daycare center. And that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. This was really bad, since I had planned on using Charizard to beat Erika as well as later in the run. And like I said, it's just my favorite Pokemon. But sadly in Yellow, there's no move deleter. So we just had to move forward and figure that out later. So I grinded up Butterfree to level 87 and decided since there was so much ground I had to cover between now and the next save, and the 1 in 256 glitch scares the crap out of me, that this would be good for now. We made our way over to the rock tunnel, but because we didn't have flash, I had to use a map and get through it in the dark, which isn't really that difficult, but more just annoying. And we got through it pretty uneventfully. On our way to Celadon City, we almost made a huge mistake. My Game Boy I'm not sure if that was the 1 in 256 glitch, or if the Gen 1 AI just has lower accuracy for some reason, but we got incredibly lucky there. So, I made sure to study the list of Pokemon who get Quick Attack in Gen 1, so I wouldn't make that mistake again, since we were clearly given a second chance on that one. From there, we safely got to Celadon and received our newest team member, the Gift Eevee. We decided that Flareon would be the best choice here, since we still needed a Fire-type and Flareon has really good attack, which is perfect for Quick Attack. We named him Rick Flareon, or Rick Flare for short since that wouldn't fit, and immediately went to the store to evolve him. Before we took on Erica, we decided it would be best to grind him up in the daycare to get Flamethrower, but we just had to be careful not to delete Quick Attack. The daycare will automatically teach your Pokemon any new moves they learn from Level Up and delete the top move that you have, so we just had to keep making sure that Quick Attack was never the top move as we leveled him up. After getting to level 81, we were more than ready to take on Erica's gym. Her Tangela, Weeping Bell, and Gloom were no match for Rick Flareon's Flamethrower, and the fourth badge was ours. So now we finally had half the badges, and three of our team were at level 80, and no matter what, they could never get below that because the fourth checkpoint was in the books. 
We made our way over to the game corner and took down the rockets in the hideout, since I count the poke with all skip of Lavender Tower as a glitch and I didn't want any asterisks next to my damageless run. We made quick work of Jesse and James, who yes, I forgot to mention, are in this game, we did encounter them back in Mount Moon, but they're never really an issue because they kind of suck. It was then time for the first Giovanni battle. We took out his Onyx and Rhyhorn with Butterfree Psybeam and Persian with Pikachu's Thunderbolt, and grabbed the Sylph Scope and got the hell out of there. After making our way to the Lavender Tower, it was once again time to face our rival, Damage. His team was still not an issue though, as we took down Fira with Thunderbolt, Magnemite with a Flamethrower, even though it isn't super effective in Gen 1, but we're like 60 levels higher, so I wasn't worried. Shelter with a Thunderbolt, Sandshrew with a Psybeam, and Eevee with a Thunderbolt as well. Honestly, at this point, my only concern with these fights was the 1 in 256 glitch, but thankfully we got through with no problems. We climbed the rest of the tower, taking out all the Chandlers that we had to face along the way. At the top, we calmed the spirit of the dead Marowak, and once again were greeted by Jesse and James, who, once again, were pushovers, going down to a Thunderbolt and two Psybeams. Mr. Fuji then thanked us from saving him from those inconveniences by giving us the Poke Flute, which allowed us to make some more progress. I decided to face the Snorlax over by Celadon, since the bike path was the far easier route to Fuchsia City for this run, and stopped to get the HM for Fly along the way. Snorlax was easy, since there was no way in hell I was going to try to catch it, and thanks to some very careful maneuvering, we were able to avoid every single trainer on the route, getting to Fuchsia City with no issues. I was feeling really good about this run, but I think now is a good time to talk about one of the issues that had been hanging over our heads the entire time, and that's Quick Attack. So far into the run, Quick Attack had been an issue that we've definitely had to overcome a few times, specifically with the Lass's Pidgey, but my big concern for the entire run was with our rival fight at the end of the Elite Four and Blaine. They both have really strong Pokemon who know Quick Attack, and I didn't think that with our own Quick Attacks we'd be strong enough to Oko either one of them even at level 100. Also, every other move that those Pokemon knew were damaging moves, so hoping for luck with Sand Attack or Tail Whip was simply not an option. And with the Gen 1 AI being a bunch of dirty cheaters, I knew that if I tried for any other move, they would just quick attack me and I would have to reset, which for the Elite Four was something I really didn't want to have to deal with. But it was at this point that we made the realization that the same AI that was going to be a problem was also going to be the solution. In Gen 1, the AI 100% of the time will use a move that is super effective when they have one. Since all of the quick attack Pokemon we were facing were going to be fire types, the solution became very clear. We needed either a Pinsir or a Scyther from the Safari Zone. Both Pinsir and Scyther are bug types, meaning that no matter what, the AI would never use Quick Attack against them and would choose a non-priority fire move instead. They both also have some of the highest attack stats in the game and learn the move Slash, which in Gen 1 is pretty much guaranteed to crit every single time. This meant that by catching one of these Pokemon and leveling them up, we could outspeed any non-priority move and take them down with a single Slash before they could get us back. We finally had the answer to one of the biggest problems in the game. But, catching one of these Pokemon was much easier said than done. The good news was that they were both in the Safari Zone, meaning we could attempt to catch them with zero risk of taking any damage. The bad news was that both of them had incredibly low encounter rates, being less than 3% for each of them, so even finding one was going to be an issue. On top of that, every time we did find one, their capture rate is also incredibly low, and they have a tendency to run away, meaning it was going to be very hard to finally secure one for the team. I figured though that going for either one would be smart, since they both served the same purpose, and that way we had better chances of finding at least one of them. We got the HM for Surf as well as the Gold Teeth, and after a few failed attempts at Scyther and somehow catching a Tauros that we were never going to use, I decided it would be smarter to get the next badge before attempting to catch one. I knew this would take a while, and after everything we had accomplished since the last gym, I wanted to be safe and have the checkpoint under our belts. As expected, Koga was not a problem for us at all. Rick Flareon was able to take down his three Venonats and his Venomoth with a Flamethrower, earning us our 5th badge and yet another precious save point. On a side note, I'm not sure why Koga's team sucks so much in Pokemon Yellow, but I'm definitely not complaining. With that out of the way, I decided that now would be the best time to catch a Pokemon for us to fly around on, so I recklessly tried to catch the first Doduo that I saw and got hit, forcing us to reset. But honestly, that wasn't really such a big deal since we had literally just saved the game a few seconds before. This time, I played it a lot safer and went back to Cerulean to catch a Pidgey that I named Burb. Since now we needed Surf to progress further in the story, and I didn't want to make the same mistake that I did with Charmander, I put Squirtle in the daycare and proceeded to grind him up. Which meant more running up and down. Yay. However, I decided that this would now be the best time to try to catch Scyther or Pinsir, 
since the steps I take here would count towards Turtle's experience, and I knew this was going to take a while. Plus, I needed it for Blaine, which was the next gym I had planned to take on. But my god, was I not prepared for how long this was going to take. I spent well over an hour and a ton of my money just trying to catch one of these Pokemon, failing so many attempts along the way. Not only that, but there would be entire sessions in the Safari Zone where I would straight up not even see one of them. Along the way though, I did catch a Chansey that I named Helen, a Rhyhorn that I named Spikes, a Nidoran that I named Need to Ran, and a Kangaskhan that I named Mama K. All of which I had no intentions of using, but just caught anyways because why not. But finally, after all that time and money spent, we caught a pincer. I named him Clamps, because I think that's a great name for a pincer. Now, of course, it was time for some more grinding. My plan here was to take on Blaine before Sabrina for a number of reasons. For starters, with our new pincer and Blastoise combination, I figured he would be a breeze, whereas Sabrina's level 50 Alakazam honestly scared the crap out of me. Also, to get to Sabrina, you have to clear out the entire Sylph Tower first meaning we need to take on both our rival and Giovanni again. Since I figured there were way too many chances for things to go wrong there and I could get to Blaine with barely any more trainer battles, I wanted to get that save point so I would never have to catch Pinsir again. After way too much grinding, Pinsir was up to level 98 and Blastoise was up to level 96, which honestly was good enough for me. So I taught Blastoise the HM for Surf, grabbed the Strength HM from the Warden back in Fuchsia, and made my way from Pallet Down all the way down to Cinnabar Island, making sure to surf all the way to the side to avoid every single trainer. We then got the secret key from the Burned Mansion. After successfully answering all the gym's trivia questions, besides the first one because it's a trick question that's purposely worded to get you wrong, it was time to take on Blaine himself. This battle was by no means a sure thing, so I was rightfully nervous going into it since I really, really didn't want to have to do all of that again. He led off with his Ninetales, which knows Quick Attack, so it was up to Clamps to take him down with a Slash. After that was Rapidash, and I decided that Clamps Slash would probably be our strongest move on the team, so I left him in to deal with that. Finally was his level 54 Arcanine, and once again, a Slash from Pinsir was more than enough to get the job done, meaning we had earned ourselves the sixth badge of the run and probably one of the most important saves of the entire game. With that out of the way and our team looking really friggin' spicy, it was time to take on the Sylph Tower. I, of course, took the most direct route possible in order to have the fewest battles that we could. I fought the first grunt and grabbed the card key. However, to grab it, I needed to clear some inventory space, so I used the protein on clamps to boost his attack. I then took out the second grunt, who had two radicates on his team, which both learned quick attack, but thankfully Rick Flareon was strong enough to handle them both with a quick attack of his own. It was then time for one of the most notorious fights in the game, the fifth rival fight. This is the point in the game where he begins to become an actual threat, having evolved most of his team, including his Eevee, into Flareon, like I mentioned earlier. But we did our research and prepared the best strategy possible for the battle. We led off with Turtle, who used Surf to take out Sandslash. After that, he sent out his Cloyster, who was no match for a Thunderbolt from Lucky. We then sent out Rick Flareon, who took care of his Magneton with a Flamethrower. Up next was his Kadabra, which was no match for a Slash from Clamps, and finally his own Flareon, who we baited into not using Quick Attack by keeping Clamps out there, and taking him down with yet another Slash. Another battle in the books. We grabbed the Gift Lapras, which we named Frick, because Frick Lapras, those things are so annoying to face in competitive play, and took the Teleporter down to take on Giovanni. I, of course, was stopped by Jesse and James again, but as per usual, they suck, so it wasn't an issue. From there, it was once again time to take on the boss himself, Giovanni. This time around, his team was definitely harder, but we were still more than capable to defeat him. His Nidorino went down to a Psybeam from Better Flea, Persian went down to a Slash from Clamps, and both Rhyhorn and Nidoqueen were handled by a Surf from Turtle. All would have been fantastic, but it was during this battle that I noticed something really alarming that you two might have noticed if you were being very astute. Looking at Pinsir's HP, we apparently had lost two health points at some point leading up to Giovanni. I was honestly shocked, since I was almost 100% sure that at no point any of the other Pokemon had even attacked us. So Chat and I decided to roll back the footage and take a look to see what happened. Turns out that because Gen 1 is basically held together with duct tape, what happened was when I used the protein on Pinsir to raise his attack stat, it for some reason raised his max HP as well. But when it did this, it failed to raise his current HP, so he was down the two point difference. After talking it over with Chat, I decided that I wanted this to be a truly damageless run with no asterisks whatsoever, so I took the reset and went back to the last save point. Although I did count this as a separate reset since I really didn't do anything wrong here. So we made our way back to the tower. 
this time tossing an Ultra Ball instead of using the Protein, took down our rival again, which went the exact same way, so I'll spare you the recap, and made Team Rocket blast off again. It was once again time for Giovanni, so we side-beamed his Nidorino, slashed his Persian, and used Bite on his Rhyhorn. Oh no, I used the wrong move! Oh, please use Harden. Oh no, I didn't mean to do that. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, at this point in the battle, I was moving so quickly that I accidentally used a Bite instead of Surf, which in Gen 1 is a normal type move, so it was resisted by Rhyhorn, and we took a stomp. So I had to reset yet again. So, once again, Card Key, Rival, Rockets, and back to Giovanni. We made it back to Rhyhorn, and I decided that to be safe, I was going to move Surf to the top of the move list, since you have to do that in battle in this game. Only, when I was doing that, I accidentally hit A, and bit the damn Rhyhorn again. At this point, I was just mad at myself, because this should not have taken more than one attempt, and it was going to be our fourth try here in the Sylph Tower. By now, I'm sure you know the drill. Card Key, Rival, Rockets, which at this point I was just doing on max speed, and back to the boss. After the side beam on Nidorino and the slash on Persian, I was incredibly careful to use Surf on the Rhyhorn, which I thankfully did this time. From there was another Surf on his Nidoqueen, and we finished that fight, hopefully once and for all. We got our Master Ball from the President and made our way over to Sabrina's gym. In yellow, Sabrina's team consists of three Pokemon, all of which are at level 50. Those are an Abra, a Kadabra, and an Alakazam. Alakazam is one of the strongest Pokemon in Gen 1, with an absolutely ridiculous special stat of 135, which is second only to Mewtwo. In Gen 1, Special also covers both Special Attack and Special Defense, so that meant we really needed to rely on physical moves here to take him down, since his defense stat is a far less impressive 45. So that meant that this was a job for our boy Clamps. Abra and Kadabra I was not worried about at all, and thankfully when we got to Alakazam, he was also not an issue and went down to a Slash as well. We had defeated Sabrina and earned ourselves the second to last badge of the game. Since there was nothing in between the 7th and 8th badge, I decided that now would be the best time to do our final grinding before the Elite Four, so that if something happened we would be safe and not have to do that again. So I went to the daycare one last time, thank god, and leveled up the remainder of our team to at least level 97. Besides Burb, since he was basically a glorified taxi. From there was time for the final gym and the battle against Giovanni, and I was not going to use the wrong moves this time. He led off with Doug Trio, who was no match for a Surf from Turtle and then went into his Persian. Just to be safe, I switched over to Clamps and took it out with a Slash. From there, Nidoqueen, Nidoking, and Rhydon were all easy one-shots with Surf, and just like that, we had taken down Giovanni for the final time, causing him to flee in shame and allowing us to save the game one last time. With that behind us, it was time to make our way to the final challenge, but not without one more run-in from our rival damage. He led off with Sand Slash, who was no match for Turtle Surf. Then he sent out the newest member of his team, Execute, who was easily taken care of with a flamethrower from Rick Flareon. His Cloyster went down to Lucky's Thunderbolt, and his Magnemite to another flamethrower from Flareon. After that, Clamps took care of his Kadabra and Flareon with Slash, and the battle was ours. It was only the Victory Road standing between us and the final challenge of this run, the Elite Four. I knew the entire run, the Elite Four was not going to be easy, but while building the team, I felt as though we had covered our bases pretty well. After making our way through the Victory Road, it was time to put that to the test. We used our last rare candy on Lucky, since he was with us every step of the way, and went past the point of no return. Let's do this. Up first was Lorelei, the master of ice Pokemon. Thankfully for us, almost every member of our team is also a water type, so leading off with Lucky was the obvious choice. Lucky used Thunder on Dugong, Cloyster, and Slowbro, taking them all down easily. I then switched into Rick Flareon to Flamethrower the Jinx, who was the only non-water type Pokemon on the team, and out next was her Lapras. I was a little concerned for this one, since Lapras has a ton of HP and a pretty decent special stat, but Lucky was able to one-shot it with a Thunderbolt, winning us the first battle. After Lorelei, we went into the next room to take on Bruno, the Fighting-type master. He led off with Onix, so I started the battle with Turtle to take him down with a Surf. From there, he sent out Hitmonchan and Hitmonlee, both of whom were no match for Better Flea's Psybeam. Then was his second Onix, which suffered the same fate as the first, and finally his Machamp. As scary as Machamp may seem, it thankfully is a very underwhelming special stat, so it didn't stand a chance from a Psybeam. And with that down, there were two trainers out of the way, but this is where the real challenge began, with Agatha. Agatha's team consists of Poison and Ghost types, which in this game are all Poison types, so she's pretty much just a Poison trainer. Her team is by no means a pushover, 
as she has not one, but two Gengars. Gengar has the third highest special stat in Gen 1. So even though Psychic type moves are super effective, it still wasn't a sure thing that we would take them down with a non-stab Psybeam from Butterfree. But I figured at level 98, this shouldn't be a problem, right? She let off with her level 56 Gengar, so we let loose a Psybeam, and without critting, we took it down. So I was feeling pretty good. I switched into Lucky to take out the Golbat with a Thunderbolt, and then back to Butterfree to one-shot Haunter and Arbok. Finally, it was time for her level 60 Gengar. And... Uh-oh. Oh, no, 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 no. Please. Yeah, just as I feared, we were just not strong enough to take out her second Gengar. This could have been concerning, but I did have an idea. We made our way past the rival once again and back down the victory road without any issues. And this time I used that rare candy on Butterfree instead of Pikachu. Sorry, buddy. I figured this would make us just strong enough to take out that second Gengar. Although now I was concerned about Lorelei's Lapras in that first battle. So I went back in for round two. Only this one ended a lot sooner due to our old friend, the one in 256 glitch. Free. We got 256th. Oh, we got 256th! No! So once again, we had to go back through the victory road and back to the Elite Four for attempt number three. Once again, Lorelei didn't give us too many issues, although I was concerned for her Lapras, but thankfully we were still able to one-shot it with a Thunderbolt from Lucky. Up next was Bruno, who once again was a complete pushover, and just like that, we were back to Agatha. As expected, we took out the first Gengar with a Psybeam, then switched over to Pikachu to quickly take out Golbat. Butterfree was back out to one-shot Haunter and Arbok, and then it was time for the moment of truth with Gengar. We have a level higher than we were before, can we finally one-shot it? Please, for the love of God, please, please, please. Yes! If this didn't work, we were going to need an entirely new strategy, which I was not looking forward to. But thankfully, Butterfree was just strong enough to take it down, winning us the battle and letting us move on to the Dragon Master himself, Lance. To put it bluntly, Lance is scary. His team consists of some of the strongest Pokemon in the entire game, and as the last member of the Elite Four, their levels are no joke either. But, like everything else in this entire run, we had a plan going in and it was just about executing. We had done the calcs, analyzed his entire team, and it was time to fight. Here's what happened. Lance led off with his Gyarados, but thanks to Lucky's Thunderbolt being four times super effective, we took him down no problem. Up next was the first of his two Dragonairs, and it was time for our secret weapon, Turtle. Back in Celadon, we had grabbed the TM for Ice Beam from the girl on top of the department store. Thankfully, both his Dragonairs were no match for that, and they both went down with no issue. After that was his Aerodactyl, which Lucky was able to deal with with a Thunderbolt. And finally, his Ace, his level 62 Dragonite. Dragonite is one of the strongest Pokemon in the entire game, so even with Ice Beam being four times super effective, I was still concerned about our level 97 Blastoise being strong enough to one-shot him. But, we do. Please, please one shot. Please, 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 please. Yes! Yes! Yes, let's go! And with that, the Elite Four were defeated, and we were the Pokemon League champions. Or we would have been, but we had one more challenge ahead. We had to face another trainer, and his name is Damage. He beat the Elite Four before us. He was the real Pokemon League champion. My friends, this was it. This was what the entire run had led up to. One fight separated us from true glory, and we knew it wasn't going to be easy. So, we took a deep breath and went into the next room for the final showdown for all the marbles. Through this door, it's the last battle of the entire run. I never in a million years thought we'd make it this far, so let's just do it. He's going to tell us. He's the most powerful trainer in the world. It is time to take him down. The last battle of the entire run against Damage himself. The first one. Surf. It hits. This should one shot. I don't see how this won't. That's one down. That's one down. 
Clamps should be able to take it down with a slash. Let's find out. Yes. That's two. Alright, Executor, Flareon, you got this, my dude. It hits. And it kills. Magneton, we said we're going to go back into Pinsir because it's not a steel type in this game. And Pinsir by far hits the hardest. Another one down. Oh my god, guys, we're almost there. Oh my god, I'm like, I'm shaking right now. <laughs> Oh my god, we're actually gonna do this. Please kill. Please kill. Please kill. One shot, please. <laughs> oh my god. The last Pokemon of the entire run, guys. The reason we got clamps. <sighs> oh my god. Oh my god, guys. Alright. Ah, oh, this is it! Here we go. We're gonna press it, and just hope we don't miss. Oh, come on. Come on. Yes! <laughs> we did it! We beat Pokemon Yellow without taking a single hit point of damage! Oh. My. God! <laughs> I didn't even think it was possible. Oh my god, we did it. Oh my god, it's over. Oh my god, the run is over. And we did it. And that, my friends, is how we beat Pokemon Yellow without taking a single hit point of damage in only 56 resets. Overall, I have to say this was incredibly rewarding, even though the grinding was absolutely brutal and it was very frustrating at times. But if you guys do decide to take this on for yourself, let me know how your runs go. I'd love to hear what you guys do differently. Guys, if you made it to the end of this video, thank you so, so much for watching. If you enjoyed, please consider leaving a like, comment, and subscribing. I really appreciate you guys making it this far. And of course, feel free to join me over on my Twitch channel. We have so much fun over there. That's going to do it for me today, my friends. Stay safe out there, be nice to each other, and thank you guys so much for watching. I'll see you guys on the next one.